Welcome to Physicists in the Wild. My name is Aggie Branchik. In this series, I chat with physicists who pursued careers outside of academia. In this first episode, I'm delighted to welcome Rowan Dalton, who did his PhD at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, in experimental quantum optics, and who now works as a data engineer in the fintech industry in New York City. Uh, yeah, so my official job title uh, is software engineer. I uh, I work for a um, basically a hedge fund over in the US now, you know, software engineering to focus on, on data. So how did you end up doing a PhD? It started all really um, on my first day of year 12. And my year 12 physics teacher was this guy, um, Graham George, who was very uh, passionate about physics and about teaching physics. And he gave us this big speech about, you know, sort of physics isn't a subject, it's a noble endeavor and how you know, basically if you uh, understand physics, you can understand anything. And that, that made me much nerdier about physics than um, any of my other subjects. At that point, though, I wanted to be a, a psychiatrist. And then I should, when I got to university and started doing biology and realized that I didn't like biology at all because it was just basically just stamp collecting. And as you know, I was very lazy when I was in undergrad and would not go to most of my lectures or any of my lectures. And at least with physics, uh, it didn't matter as much. I understood the concept. Having not been to the lectures wasn't as big of a detriment. I, like, I remember at least you know, a couple of exams, it would be a question and I'd sort of spend two pages deriving some equation and getting, getting the equation like, ah, oh, that was in the lecture. And if I'd been paying more attention, I could have just started from this point, but it didn't matter because, you know, fundamentally, if you understood it, you could, you could get to where you needed to go. Whereas with the biology exams, like, you either knew it or you didn't know why right? it was multiple choice. It was just, you know, what is this thing? You know, I don't know. So um, I discovered pretty quickly that I did not like biology and it wasn't a good fit for how lazy I was. Um, so I decided to stick with physics and then just seeing like, you know, if you wanted to be a physicist, that was just the thing that you did, right? Like you did, you did, you did your undergraduate degree, you got a PhD in physics, you became a postdoc and I didn't think too hard about it. It just seemed like, well, if I'm going to be a physicist and that's what I like doing, then I should just go and be, but that's how you become a physicist. How is it that you got into the job that you're doing now? The hands-on sort of side of things and the doing research side of things was always something that I uh, enjoyed uh, a lot. The The question sort of really came you know, more towards the end. I was thinking about you know, what I wanted to do next. And thinking, you know, so talking to people and thinking about it and sort of that, you know, it felt to me like the more you progressed in physics, the, the less and less physics you actually do, right? It becomes much more about, you know, grants, justifying grants you've already been given and just a lot more sort of administration. So I was thinking about what I wanted to do next and I didn't know what it was. And I also didn't really know, think that there were many options. I was thinking very, very specifically in this term of, you know, single photon uh, quantum computing experiments. I'm like, oh, I'm really good at, you know, beam steering and setting up experiments and quantum tomography and whatever. And these are not skills that are important to anyone outside of experimental physics, right? Like no one has ever asked me in the subsequent time to, you know, perform quantum tomography. So... I was like, oh man, what do I, what do I do with these skills, right? No one else wants, uh, you know, people who can do this. I was out in the valley one night and I ran into a uh, old coworker of mine. She was working at the time for a, a hedge fund in Brisbane and said, well, you know, why don't you come down and have an interview with us? So I went down um, and interviewed and I was like, yes, this is it. Because the skills that, you know, sort of they, that they were after, were the things that I hadn't really been thinking about so much, where it was very much about, you know, uh, like programming, some, you know, um, analysis, data modeling, but like problem solving, how do you look at this data or figure, you know, and I was like, oh, 
I can do other things that I didn't really think about too hard because in my head, like everyone does this, right? Like this is a, just a very basic skill that everyone has. Like, oh no, it's not a very basic skill everyone has. It's a skill that most physicists have because everyone in physics does these, does these things. But it's uh, apparently a very hard thing to hire for outside. And they said, look, we, we really like you. We'd like to give you a job because you can do all of these things that we're try having trouble you know, trying to find people to do. And I was like, great, I will come and work for you. So can you tell uh, us a little bit about what your day-to-day -day is like? I th think there's a lot of variation, sort of very much depending on sort of the project. It's largely, you know, very much by last still problem solving which is you know something that i really enjoy uh it's just yeah now i do it it's there's less mirrors and less beam splitters and it's all it's all keyboards and, and monitors uh but you know I, the, the the general problem is uh you know, around things like so there's obviously there's the dial ingesting is a big part of that so whether you're you know connecting to some like REST API, gRPC server, um, an external database, uh, FTP site, SFTP, um, web scraping, you know, whatever that, whatever that mechanism is, um, you know, then around ingestion, storage, um, you know, quality control, making sure that things are, that things exist, that they look right. So there's like building out all of those tools to basically make it easier for people to access all the different types of data that we provide in Sort of unified, you know, uniform ways, and then there's almost like DevOps style things. So monitoring Kubernetes clusters and monitoring the health of the, you know, of REST API services, and uh, you know, like making sure the CI/CD pipelines were all working properly. I've had to like learn a lot of things about sort of stock market and things like you know, futures and options and interest rate swaps and all this kind of stuff. That's the only part that's really specific to about being finance is the fact that these are financial data and financial vendors, but the actual, the building of the pipelines and the building of APIs and the databases and the monitoring, it's, it's all very um, data engineering. So what would you say are your most favorite and least favorite aspects of your job? Uh, my most favorite aspect is definitely like building things and, you know, building cool things that people use. Um, you know, it's always nice I think, when you start, you know, like a brand new sort of project and get to sort of sit down and think about what the problem is that you're trying to solve and figure out, you know, which technologies you're going to use and how you're going to you know, build this thing and whatever. And, um, that's definitely the, the, the best part. Uh, and the, probably the worst part is the is the exact opposite. It's dealing with like legacy code and just dreadful decisions that were made by people who aren't even at the company anymore. Do you find that you work with a lot of physicists? A lot, um, more on the uh, on the quant side than on the on the you know software engineering side. But yeah, um, quantitative finance is absolutely full of ex physicists. Let's say there is a physics PhD student who's interested in transitioning into that field. Now, what skills should this person learn? Or is that even the right thing to ask? Ooh, um, it is a good question. I would say that they're going to want to have a sort of, you know, decent background, probably in Python tools like pandas, uh, you know, NumPy for doing actual analysis and creating plots. If you are doing data analysis at the moment for, you know, experiments or whatever, and you're doing it in Python, you are probably off to a good start. Um, you know, there are other skills that are nice. There are teams out there that are building, that are working on machine learning type modeling, but that's not everyone. You don't have to know how to use, you know, TensorFlow or Keras or whatever. People out there that use R still, um, it's not nearly as prevalent as it used to be, but you might need to know it at some point. But I would say that regardless of what role you're going to go into, just having like a solid Python data analysis skills are going to be a universal. You're going to want pretty much any sort of quantitative finance role to go into. Do you think boot camps or online courses are a good way to learn those skills? Um, I think it depends very much on the context. So I would say if you are a like pure physicist and you want to rush up or get a bit better at that type of skill, probably yes. Because that way, like, when someone looks at your resume, 
they're going to say, oh, well, this person has a you know a background in physics. They got a you know PhD in physics, and they've done this data boot camp. And great. If it's just a data boot camp, and you know you're coming, that's that's all that you've got. It's probably not going to get you a phone call. I tend to think of them as signaling to your potential employer that you have the capacity to learn this stuff. And as long as you can communicate that you know how to learn new things, then on the job, I guess, is where you're going to. Yeah, I think that's a that's a huge skill that not everyone has. You know, my background was in physics and I did everything in MATLAB, right? So I have basically had to learn when I, I use zero MATLAB at any moment, right? So everything I know, I have, I have to learn. I had to learn, right? So I've... This is what, what all the books are behind me. Like I have taught myself, you know, everything about databases and Python and different programming languages and, um, you know, different technologies. So think of you know, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, but I've also been in roles where, you know, people have had to learn new things. I'm like on the job, they're like, oh, we're going to learn this. I'm like, dude, what is wrong with you? We are paying you to learn it. Like just suck it up and learn it. <laughs> The book I would recommend to people probably more than anything else is um, Fluent Python. A second edition of it actually just came out and I like it so much that I bought the second edition even though I already had the first edition. <laughs> so I feel like there's a lot of books out there on sort of, you know, Python and on data analysis that, you know, not that they're bad, but they don't go into the depth of all, but a lot of that, you know, something like that something like Fluent Python does. It, it, it's the one that's really, really made me understand how a lot of the like inner workings of um, of the language and how to do some like very cool things that I normally discourage people from doing, but that are awesome in certain situations. And then the other one that I um, more for uh, the data side of things is this one. Um, Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Kretman. Um, it's very, you know, there's no sort of real code in it or anything. And just sort of lots of diagrams talking about uh, very subtle ways that things can go wrong. But yeah, if you if you want to get into um, specifically around building applications that ingest data and store data, that is definitely the one to go with. Uh, yeah, they, they would be my two recommendations. Uh, what about how you have to dress to the office? I just jeans and t-shirt, jeans and a hoodie. Okay. Uh, there are people who come into the office in shorts. Uh, I don't don't dress quite that casually, but yeah, like it's not it's not fancy at all. If I was a young physics PhD student right now, uh, thinking about what I want to do with my life, uh, what advice would you give me? Even yes, even if you do not think that you end, are going to end up using your PhD, right? It doesn't mean that you have not acquired a huge number of skills over those, you know, sort of many years that you are going to be able to take to something else. If you're at the end of it, I would say, look, whatever, just finish it, figure out what you want to do, and go and do that. If you're at the start and you're already thinking to yourself, is this like if that's if this is not where I want to end up? then just stop now and go and do the thing that you really want to be doing. Thank you so much, Rowan. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I love that you were my first guest and I'm sure- I'm, uh, uh, I'm very honored, Aggie. A lot of value from this. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've even got a Ralph splitter there. Yeah, I was wondering if you would notice. Straight away, I think it's very appropriate.